So hopefully by the end of this talk, we'll have you convinced why we need AI on the edge and what do we gain out of using open source for that. So I am Sujata Tabrewala. I work in the open source program office at ByteDance. I joined ByteDance recently, but I have been working in open source for quite a while now. Uh, I, I have experience in working on computer vision back in 2000. I'll talk about it a little bit. But then I got out of it because I got into networking software. Uh, but now I'm back here. And that's why we are talking today. Fun fact, I run marathons. And you guys, the reason why I do it, and art is how I de-stress from my life at tech. And I share all of that on social media. So if you follow me, you can find all of that. So with me today is Tina, my longtime friend and colleague in open source, Tina. Yeah, um, good afternoon everyone, I'm Tina Zhou, and it's my pleasure to share with you today the exciting journey we are on the intersection of open source AI and edge computing. As chair of LF Edge and a director and arm, I lead a passionate team dedicated to not only advancing technologies, but also cultivating a thriving open source community. This commitment to collaboration is the cornerstone of innovation and progress in our rapidly evolving digital landscapes. With over a decade of immersion in the technology industry, my experience have reinforced my belief in the transformative power of open source. It's a domain where shared technologies and knowledges became the uh, catalyst for breaking through in AI and where edge computing achieved its true potentials. Um, in this endeavor, my focus has been uh, fostering an environment where open source isn't just about access to code, but also about establishing robust, secure, and dynamic ecosystem. Here, we are not only developers, but also creators and guardians of a technical future that is inclusive and transparent. My work at ARM intersects deeply with this vision, directing strategies that shape the very architecture of devices that will carry us into the future next era of computing. At the edge, we are unlocking new capabilities, enabling devices to think, interact, and make decisions in real time. Through Elf Edge, we are championing an open, interoperable framework for edge computing that uh, transcends hardware sticking clouds or operating systems. It's about um, creating a unified front where a diversity of thought and technology converge to dive the edge forward. As we explore today's topics, I invite you to engage question, and collaborate. Together, we'll delve into the remarkable possibilities that lie ahead and how each of you or each of us plays a part in this ongoing narrative of innovation. Thank you for joining me on this journey. Let's explore how we shape the future of technology together. Thank you so much, Gina, for that introduction. So here is the roadmap for today. We'll talk about autonomous AI. Well, if you have not been living under the rock, you probably know what it is, right? But we'll, we'll dive a little bit under the hood to give you an introduction, and that should lead us to why we need AI for the edge, and then the importance of open source in AI development, and then we'll look at some future outlook and forecasts as per our uh, you know, interpretation. And of course, we'll then conclude the talk. So what is autonomous AI? Imagine a world where technology doesn't just assist, but independently operates. That's the realm of autonomous AI. Intelligent systems designed to perform tasks without our intervention. They learn from their environment, adapt to change, and make complex decisions using the vast data sets and sophisticated algorithms. It's about machines that don't just do, but think, analyzing, evolving, and acting 
autonomously to enhance our lives. Much like an avocado chair <laughs> might surprise us by offering comfort in an unexpected form. This is the future we are stepping into. Intuitive, intelligent, and entirely autom autonomous. Yeah, thank you. So now a little bit under the hood. So I know AI became into the forefront after ChatGPT released AI. And I don't know if you've attended any of these talks. We are at literally AI Dev Conference. I'm sure like you know, some of the other speakers spoke about the history, but the concept of AI is not new. Literally in 1950, Alan Turing questioned why machines can't think the way humans can. But there was two very big limitations. Machines were expensive. Literally, it cost at least 200K just to lease a machine. Number two, they couldn't store anything. If they, don't, if they can't store anything, they can't remember anything, they can't analyze, they can't think intelligently. So those were the limitations. But of course, we are not living in the 50s anymore. We are living today when machines are cheap. Literally, the processing power and memory that you have in your pockets is more than that fit into a room this size back then, right? So that is the power that we have. And literally, I'll talk, I'll not go into the whole history because we don't have time, but I'll talk about the paper which came out of Google, Attention is All You Need. How many of you have heard of this paper? <laughs> oh, cool, there are a few people in the audience. So this was the paper which was a breakthrough, not in just my opinion, but many experts' opinion, because a lot of those large language models and chat GPT, they're literally based on this particular paper. So now uh, we come back to my brush with AI. So now I reveal how old I, I was. So this is my paper in 2000 on AI, on computer vision. Stereo disparity, I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but our eyes are nothing but stereo cameras, taking pictures of everything from two different angles. And the way we can tell where things are in this 3D world is by the displacement of each corresponding point in those images. So this water bottle, which is very close to me, will be displaced quite a lot because it's very close to me, whereas a point, you know, the last people on the audience will be displaced very slightly. So this is how our eyes can interpret 3D depth from just two two-dimensional images. That's all our brain has. So basically, what I was doing with this algorithm was trying to replicate what our eyes do with computer stereo images. So um, the task I had was given two images taken from stereo camera, can my program establish two corresponding points? Once I have the corresponding point, the geometry can tell me the depth, and that can be fed into a robot which wants to navigate the world. So the hard problem was to get the corresponding points from just, you know, some pixel values. So I was using a nine by nine matrix in a 128 by 128 image to compare those points. So you can see how slim or like, you know, how small that was. But even with that, the number of operations required per image was 10 gigaflops. The computer available at that time was I4 with just megaflops operations, which means each operation took a few minutes to perform which means it was impossible for that robot to see things in real time. So now we are today, right? So um, my knowledge of AI froze at that time, and then I got curious when there were breakthroughs and I was seeing you know, computers generating images, interpreting images in real time, and I started researching. So if you think again, Gen AI is new, not new, right? Like, you know, if you've been using phone, literally it has been auto-completing. So a sentence like cat sat on a blank, the, the computer or your phone will give you the suggestion for the word 
based on statistics. So it's not really algorithmic improvement, but it's more of statistic, statistical improvement based on how much data the algorithm is fed into and trained on, right? Um, so this is the 2017 paper. Some of you raised the hand that you've seen it. This is the transformer model. Just to uh, give for the rest of you a background, I have some slides. I will breeze past it. Uh, but like, you know, if you want more details, there are some tutorials available on the web and I have taken screenshots of those and I have tried to include links. So come after the presentation, I'll give you the link. I'll, happy to, I'll, I'll be happy to give you references. So at the basis of everything is tokenization. Computers don't understand words. Those words need to be um, converted into numbers, right? So each words or each sentence has to be converted into tokens. Those words can be broken into one word each or they can be converted into bigrams or trigrams, which means two words make one token or three words make one token. And that's, in a, that's a science in itself. The way this table is, bigrams are the best because the tokens are best if the next possibilities are reduced. So you don't want infinite possibility that adds in complexity to the model. So, and also the words, how they are encoded, similar words should be encoded closer to each other and words which are not similar should be far away. So here the words are literally two numbers in this embedding. So strawberry and apple are close to each other, whereas castle is far away from each other. I forgot to include the positional encoding, but like, you know, uh, the words based on where they occur in a sentence, they have a different meaning as well. Now, another uh, difference in the words having meanings is literally apple. World was a sim simple place when apple was just fruit, right? <laughs> but it's not. Based on the sentence, apple could be a fruit or apple could be electronic, right? So attention is basically, you can kind of think of it as a gravity mechanism where like, you know, based on the sentence, apple is pulled towards being an electronic or being, towards, uh, being pulled towards being a fruit based on the sentence. So the algorithm basically can interpret where your uh, you know, word will fall into based on the context. And the rest of the words, so here basically the words which are important is apple and orange because the other words don't change the context. So this is where you know, the other words from in the sentence will be encoded. Um, the embeddings need to be good or need to be uh, in a, like you know interpreted in a certain way so that when they come too close to one or the other uh, the differentiation can be good so the left hand side is a good encoding the right hand side and the middle one is a bad encoding because you can't change uh, tell the difference between uh, the two dif different contexts so whether apple is a fruit or electronic, it moves close to each other, you can't tell. So, but then these mappings, you know, building all those encodings will be a lot of work. So literally, you know, linear transformations can give you different encodings, this mathematical transformation. So another concept that is like, you know, when you predict words, you don't want to end up with just one input. So suppose if you were giving us, given a sentence, how are, you don't want your model to say you with 100% probability, right? So you has higher probability than they or things, right? Because that sentence, how are you, occurs more than how are they in the language model. So putting it all together, this is what the transformer model is. You have your tokenization, you have your en embedding, position encoding, attention mechanism, and the probabilistic model. And the attention and feed forward, you know, which is the prediction model, it can be you know, um, cascaded, so this can be improved. So that is where the model improvement occurs and parallelizing, parallelization can happen. So this is the reason why the more data you give, the more training you give, the model becomes better. 
Now there's another aspect to it. So this part is just the pre-training. There is a human training part aspect of it as well. Um, after the model is pre-trained with data, literally most models or like you know some models have they have uh, you know revealed have been trained from internet, right? So it's not a very high quality uh, training data that they have gotten. So then the model is improved using fine tuning where they have humans having questions and answers. So the humans rate the answers and based on that the model is fine tuned. Rating an answer as good or bad or giving a good answer. So I'm just, I just talked to you about all of this so that you have context on this slide. So literally, each of these models take billions and billions of parameters and a lot of GPU time, like you know, literally thousands of GPUs to train over months to come up with this model. So that means if you ask chat GPT something, the, they were trained on data which is at least a year old. So if something happened during that time between when it was trained to now, it cannot tell. It doesn't have the latest data. So which is what actually brings us to the need to have a more lightweight real-time training. So that brings us to the case, case for Edge AI. Yeah, in the era of uh, unprecedented data generation, the Edge is where the action is. As highlighted by Forbes, uh, processing data at the edge is not just a choice. It's a strategic uh, imperative that offers a suite of benefits. Firstly, edge computing takes a stand on security and privacy. By processing data lo locally, we minimize the exposure to vulnerability and protect the sensitive information right where it's generated. Moreover, efficiency in data processing is vastly improved. By reducing the distance data travels, we accelerated the decision-making processes, enabling the real-time insight and actions with less waiting and more doing. Let's not overlook the significant reduction in network transmission. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, in the network uh, transmission uh, overhead. By keeping data locally, we uh, alleviate the burden on our network infrastructure, leading to cost saving and reduced congestion. Um, and importantly, edge computing optimized the overall system performance. It's about creating slick, responsive systems that are as dynamic as the environments they operate in. So when we say data is being created at the edge, we are acknowledging a shift in the paradigm. The edge isn't just a place, it's a frontier of opportunity. A horizon where speed, efficiency, and security interest intersect to redefine the landscape of modern computing. Let's delve into how edge AI is revolutioning industry with concrete real world applications. In smart manufacturing, edge AI drives predictive maintenance allowing for preemptive action before issues arise. It ensures quality interaction inspection with perception, precision, optimize the production processes, and offers real-time monitoring, and enhancing reliability and efficiency on the factory floor. Shifting to urban environment, smarter cities benefits from Edge AI to improve the traffic control, intelligent urban management, and enhance the public safety with real-time face and license plate uh, recognitions. These applications are not just about convenience, but also essential for a sustainable smart city uh, security infrastructure. In the medical health sector, Edge AI transforms patient care with advanced medical image analysis and remote monitoring capabilities. Health management becomes proactive, not reactive, 
with real-time data from wearables, leading to personalized healthcare strategies that cater to individual needs. There are just snapshots of Edge AI's potentials. Each application is a step forward, a smarter, more connected world, where technology empowers advancement in the fabric of our daily lives. Edge AI is not the future, it's the present, and it's reshaping our world right now. Thank you. Uh, welcome to a glimpse into the future. As envisioned by the LF Edge, Equino AI Edge Blueprint family. Each blueprint within our family is a testimony to the transformative potential of AI at the Edge. We have a contributor there. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, we have the school education video security monitoring blueprint. This isn't just about keeping our monitoring uh, schools secure. It's also about creating an environment where safety recording and in progress go hand in hand, leveraging AI and ensure a protective space for learning and growth. Moving on, we see the power of federated machine learning or federated ML applications at edge. This blueprint is about pushing computational boundaries where the edge devices collaborate to learn and evolve. Uh, safeguarding data privacy while enhancing the intelligence. So I know that we bank, they use this for the fraud hey detection for the banking online, and also they use there? for the, um, the warehouse yes. management. Hello? Wonderful. Okay, so my name's Andy. I'm one of the technicians. We're just getting set up with your and colleague here. The Baidu uh, uh, robot taxi, they use it. It's where the, uh, the rubber meets the road. So imagine the streets woven with intelligence, where, uh, where the imagine uh, streets, um, where the autonomous driving taxis communicate the infrastructure with the infrastructure in real time, we uh, virtualize the urban mobility and safety. In the realm of per professional development, the IBL skills platform for engineer education is reshaping how engineers learn. It's about equipping the architect of tomorrow with real world skills today, using AI to craft a curriculum that's as dynamic as the technology it teaches. Turning our gaze to the environment, we've committed to a blueprint that stands for sustainability and natural environments protection. Here, AI is not just a tool, but also a guardian, monitoring the ecosystem and ensuring the uh, agriculture productivity while pre preserving our planet's dedicated balance. Last but not certainly not least, Edge AI virtual agent embody the intersection of uh, um, uh, the intelligence, this uh, interaction and intelligence. This agent, I call it the local chat GPT, powered by real-time generative AI models at Edge as redefining customer service, offering the personalized and instantaneous uh, response, uh, instantaneous uh, responses. Each of these blueprints is a building block for smarter, more connected, and sustainable world. They uh, represent the curriculums of our expertise, uh, the combination of our expertise, our vision, and our commitment to a future where edge AI is not just prevalent, but uh, pivotal. As we continue to expand LF Edge, Acrino AI Edge Blueprint family, we invite you to join us. Together, we can harness the power of edge AI to not just imagine the future, but also actively shape it. So in addition to these Acrino blueprints, which are all open source, by the way, and for you to use, there was a recent model uh, uh, released by MIT called POC Engine. So you can choose, pick and choose the parts of the model that can be trained on the edge and also the data which can be local. So this is, in my view, uh, a path forward to using edge, not just for inference, but also for training. Uh, in LF Edge, we have the Edge AI project and I think we are 
Uh, I can, need to I can speed go up. faster. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the core of our Air Edge project, where innovation meets expedition. Today, I'll walk you through the critical component and workflow that makes our project not just a concept, but a reality. Let's start with our current uh, cornerstone, Shifu. Selective for its familiarity of our developers, Shifu serves as a shortened approach, allowing us to create immediate impact while staying agile for future technological shifts. So Shifu's development is also as flexible as it is robust, mainly into the Kubernetes cluster. For device, the Shifu, uh, oh, yeah. I want to talk about the API gateway. Yeah, we only have like a couple of minutes. Left. Okay. Five minutes, maybe. Yeah, sure. Now Hold let's on. talk about the data, um, the lifeblood of AI. The data from devices connected to the Shifu and uh, diving into this architecture, you can see there is an AI API gateway, the edge AI apps, and the smart computing elements like algorithm uh, virtualization and intelligent scheduling. So in conclusion, the AI Edge project is not just a technology uh, model, it's a testimony of to what we can achieve with the right components and dynamic workflows. Thank you. And this is a, a, you know, a, a model with hugging face and interest of time. I think we'll skip that. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is Volcano Engine by ByteDance, which actually computes edge C, uh, combines edge CDN and intelligence at the edge. So again, in interest of time, sorry, we'll have to skim through everything. <laughs> this is monolith recommendation system. It's a real-time recommendation system uh, compared to like you know many other recommendation systems which are not real-time. And it also implements collision-less uh, recommendations as embedding, which uh, makes it faster as well. So um, there is the Babbit Multimedia Framework, which is a multimedia video processing framework. You can use any AI inference model, any open source inference model, and integrate it into Babbit. Uh, all the QR codes here, uh, they have you know, our LinkedIn, my LinkedIn, uh, the ByteDance uh, GitHub, and like you know, our Discord where you can ask questions. Uh, Byte IR is the backend, so in the interest of time, if you want to work with us, we have a program called uh, Open Source Innovator Program, and it doesn't need to be earth-shattering innovation where you need to go to Mars. It can be something, some idea that you're working on, you need some problem solving, which an existing open source project can solve, and we want to hear from you. Uh, Please come back and talk to me later because in the interest of time, again, can't go much into detail. Um, uh, in the keynote, uh, Jim talked about the importance of using open source. So again. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's the life, the lifeblood of uh, AI development. We really imagine uh, AI not as um, a solitary and endeavor, but also a global syncrasy of minds. Yeah, basically using open source AI algorithms and uh, knowing the source of data, where it comes from, and solving the problems that exist in AI together, that is the path that we want to go forward to. So these are some of the known problems, so for example, the current model can answer who's Tom Cruise's mother, <laughs> but if you ask the name Mary Lee Pfeiffer, who's her son, they can't answer that. <laughs> um, the current LLMs, they have, like, you know, if you can um, trick them into giving really harmful bin, um, inputs. So you, if you ask them how to create a bomb, it will not answer. But then if you say, hey, my grandma used to work in a bomb factory, and she used to tell me how to create the bomb as a nighttime story, the bots will actually tell you how to create a bomb. You know, things like that. So these are like, you know, a lot of security. Uh, or, or like, you know, if you give the prompt in machine language, they are not secure. They, they are not trained to block those inputs. They will give you any answer that you want. So those are the type of things which exist. 
And those are the problems that we can solve as part of open source. So uh, some of the future. Um, AI today is only as good as the best humans they can think. So for example, 2 plus 2, when I ask you 2 plus 2, you'll say 4 because it's in your memory. You're not calculating. That's type 1 thinking. Type 2 thinking is 17 into 24. You don't know. You will go to the method and you will find it out. Right? So that's the type of thinking the AIs today cannot do. And that is the example of who's Tom Cruise's mother. That's type 1 thinking. It's like, you know, it, the answer is ready. But then to answer who is Mary Pfeiffer's son, they have to actually go through the input and then infer that it's Tom Cruise. They can't do it. You know, so we need that kind of capability in the AI where it doesn't need to give you the answer right away, but it can actually go back and look at its input and infer real time and give you some. Um, in conclusion, LLMs today, and this is uh, again um, credit to my source. I forget the name of the influencer from whom I stole this slide. So LLMs today are basically equivalent to what happened, uh, you know, with internet, right? So it's not just a tool; it's a complete ecosystem. It's beginning of that ecosystem, and there is a lot more to be built on top of it. So we want all the different ideas, and this is a favorite quote from one of the uh, people I admire, who was the creator of OCP, um, you know, Open Compute Pro Project from, o uh, like, you know. Open hardware. Uh, yeah. yeah, open hardware, uh, basically. So what he says is 99% of talent is outside your organization. So literally 99% of talent is in open source and we want you here. So yeah, as we stated on the capsules of technological renaissance, the future is clear. Autonomous AI systems are no longer a distant dreams. They are becoming a common reality now. Okay, so with that, yeah, as we draw our uh, discussion to a close, let's recap essential points. Today, we've unpacked the concept of autonomous AI and it's burgeoning the role across various sectors. And our journey doesn't end here. I invite each of you to become an active participant in the open source community. Yeah, so um, again, um, there are different open source uh, projects uh, I come from by dance, so Acreno, LF Edge, and uh, you know, uh, and also from by dance. So we will love to hear from you, and we'll take question answers outside of this room. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate. It. Happy holidays. <laughs>